<laughs> okay, there we go. It says recording has started. So can you still see me? Because I'm on my I'm on my computer screen now. Yes, I can definitely still see you. Okay, great. All right, Terry. I think let's start with what Handy mentioned lastly, because I think it's quite a nice way to start the interview. How did you get into this particular position at Mill Park? What made you decide to work with students in this role? Oh, okay. So it's quite, it's been quite a journey for me. And I really have to go back a little bit um, in terms of just my experience at university, because it wasn't the greatest experience. I never really had clear direction or felt that I received support from anyone. Um, I was one of the first people in my family to attend university. Um, so of course that meant I'm kind of figuring things out on my own um, with a lot of uncertainty um, as I navigated my experience. I just wasn't sure of what I wanted to do and where I was, where I was headed. Um, and before getting the job at Mill Park, I'd say I went through like this life-changing experience with COVID and, and everything. Um, but this experience was where I was able to truly find myself and become confident in who I am. I felt it was important for me to have a purpose and it was getting a bit frustrating that I was not able to fulfill this purpose. Um, because I applied for 10 jobs before coming to Mill Park. I did eight like pre-video interviews um, and four actual like just video interviews and got one interview um, only to be told that I was, was already unsuccessful um, via email just before that interview. I was almost ready to just give up on my purpose. Like I even started planning my online business. Um, it's still in the pipeline, but I, I wanted to take a, a whole different direction. And then I randomly started applying for jobs again and came across this one, um, you know, and I was like, what, what does this mean? Student support and development advisor, or what is this title? <laughs> Um, but then I met with um, Michael McInerney, who interviewed me, he's my um, manager, and with the heads of school, and I was like, okay, I'm just going to say whatever I feel like saying in this interview, um, and I'm just going to be myself. Um, what's the worst that can happen? And after that interview, when Michael called me to say I got the job, I was shocked, I was overjoyed, and I remember telling Mike, you know, Michael, you have no idea how much this means to me. Um, and, you know, it's it, in a way, it kind of, um, it's solely where I was always meant to be in my mind, um, with passionate people working toward the same end goal, which is just filling our purpose in the world. Um, to empower others um, to better themselves and to be um, the best at what they do and in their field. Um, thanks, Terry. Can I ask you a bit more about were you planning to be in education, in, in this sort of educational psychological space when you graduated? Um, when I graduated, I was a bit unsure of what's next. And I think I did an internship with um, women and kids who were um, abused. I was doing internship there. And initially, I, I wanted to work with children, um, to be honest. I wanted to work with kids to improve on them because I felt like, you know, them having the foundation and the right kind of um, impact from someone is going to be is kind of going to eliminate everything that comes along the way when they are adults when they are growing up yes. um, and I wanted to have an impact there and I actually got to work with kids for for a while kids teenagers um, and adults um, in my previous job um, they are kind of taught reading and learning difficulties um, and um, teaching the students um, skills on how to improve on their cognitive ability. Um, but it is also centered around like self-improvement and personal development. So um, yeah, and I think 
from what I've previously experienced with the kids, it kind of filtered into this space with students, um, like how um, how we kind of want to um, positively impact their ability to to be successful, to empower them, um, not only in the, in the, from the academic perspective, but from like self and personal development as well. Excellent. Um, can I ask, when did you start at Mill Park in your current role? So I started in February um, 2022. So that was just over a year ago. Maybe before we get to the questions that um, I sent you as well, um, how has the job, how has it been for you since February to now? It's just over a year. What is, has the job been what you thought it would be? And if it hasn't, how is it slightly different? And yeah, every day, like everyone asks me, how's your job? How's it going? And I'm like, I love my job. Like that's always my response because I couldn't have kind of asked for anything better. Every day I get to fulfill and live out my purpose, which is to empower others to have an impact on, on the individual and the community um, in a positive way. So I love what I do. It definitely ticks every every box for me, um, just being able to interact with students on a daily basis. I almost like to tell, I think last year, I being the first year, it's almost as though I journeyed with the students along their journey, especially those just starting out, because they start in February and I started in February alongside them. So you feel excited and you feel as though you want to you know do everything and put your all into the job and um, similarly with the students they want to put all into their studies and they're so passionate and as you go along you're feeling overwhelmed exactly like the students were feeling they were feeling overwhelmed by everything that they had to like look at um, and then as we progressed, you know, it starts slowing down and you start feeling, okay, what's next? You have, you find your rhythm. Um, sometimes you feel a bit burnt out, but essentially you keep on pushing, you keep on doing what you have to do to achieve your goal um, and to fulfill your purpose. And I actually ask the students or remind students of, you know, what is your purpose for doing this? Why are you here? It's important to have clear direction. Um, and the way to do that is to be clear on your reason for doing this degree, for doing, um, for tackling this challenge, because it is challenging um, for many of them, especially those that are working or are new to, to the space completely. So um, latching onto the purpose is so important for when we feel slightly demotivated, for when we feel like giving up. You know, going back and reaffirming why we are here um, is always really important and something that that gets us through, that's gotten me through to until this point. Right. Thank you. Um, can I ask the structure of your job? Um, is it are you talking to students from the word go? Are they all sort of uh, uh, what should I say? Sort of not required, but maybe encouraged to check in with you or is it only when they're in trouble? How exactly does it work? Okay, so my role is actually to provide holistic support that caters to the well-being of students while they are on the program and caters to their success. So um, support comes in different forms and in terms of my role it could be one-on-one -on -one consultations, it's group sessions that we host every week, um, it's like live sessions that I would host on specific topics um, after they write an assessment. Um, students are not required to like attend these, they're not um, you know, there's no, it's voluntary basically. So it's not compulsory for them to set up a consult or anything. It is encouraged though. Um, and I mean, I do a whole orientation session on just support and the type of support that they might need on the program. I give them kind of insight into um, the requirements of the program and what the demands would be for them, you know, having to sacrifice time somewhere else. And, um, you know, it requires a lot of time from them. But essentially, students are able to decide whether or not 
um, the type of support we offer is going to fit into their learning journey. Um, I'm going to Do you go want me to elaborate, sorry? Do you want me no, to elaborate just, on the support? No, 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 I think that's fine. I do know quite a bit about, you know, okay. the support that you do. So let's go to some of Honey's questions. What do you find are the most common issues that students struggle with? Um, it's, it's, okay, most common issues. <laughs> Is it I think that there are most common issues, or, or is it really very specific to everybody? I th there are commonalities that I have found in um, each student, um, and things like you know their mindset, maintaining a positive mindset comes to the fore quite often. Um, that's usually the outcome of all the these little common issues that they might come across. And the common issues could be like past failure, which leads to self-doubt. It could be um, difficulty with time management and planning, which stems from, you know, just not being able to organize or manage everything. And it all is rooted or stems from their mindset or approach. Mm -hmm. um, it could be setting boundaries um, at work. Um, but this fear of that because they need to prove themselves or to be part of the team and they don't want to show weakness. And that, again, stems from your mindset. Um, letting go of perfection um, is something that, that these students um, battle with because they need to be organized. They, they are in a field where, you know, there's certain steps that you need to take in order to achieve something. Um, so um, they grapple with that quite often and most commonly, it's all has to do with their mindset and experiences that they haven't experienced before and now finding ways of managing um, or coping with experiences that they haven't experienced before. And these experiences could be like disappointment or failure um, or past failures, as I said, that creep into the present space um, for them to perform. And some of them haven't experienced pressure in the same way that this program um, uh, kind of um, creates for them. Um, so mindset is something that always comes to the fore. It's always something. And um, the way in which I kind of go about assisting students in, in dealing with that is actually just asking them probing questions about why do they feel this way? You know, um, where do they think it's coming from? And providing them with the ability to reflect, I think is important because it's something that we don't often do. It's something that I find students don't often get to do. They don't do um, as much reflection in terms of themselves as well and where they are at. And I always say, um, or encourage them to reflect so that they can do kind of like a check in with themselves on a weekly basis. Like, where are they at? How are they managing? Are they coping with the study so far? Or do they need to seek some, some support from us? Thanks, I'm just writing that down. Um, just explain to me, like in layman's terms, as if I'm a student myself, why would the fact that I failed before actually keep me from being able to properly focus and study now for my next test? Because surely, mm. I mean, this is what happened in the past. I mean, why would that affect me in future? Mm. Okay, I'll try, I'll try to explain it as best as I can. Yes. Um, because each person's or individual's experience is slightly different. But the commonality is that what we what happened to us in the past is often not addressed. It's often avoided. Um, mm -hmm. The emotion is something that that triggers um, the way in which we think. It triggers it can contribute to how we physically are able to move forward and you know um, approach what we're doing in the present. So essentially, it's almost like you haven't dealt with the past, so you keep on living in the past or functioning in the place um, of the experience that you previously had. So students often come into the present space and because they are overwhelmed and over and under pressure, those emotions are unearthed again. Those emotions that they did not address come to the fore and essentially affect how they function and approach their studies in the present moment. So, yeah. And how is this very interesting? Because what do you do then? I mean, when you find your, these 
emotions from the past coming into the, your present, what do you do to deal with them? It's different for each student, but essentially um, the first step I would always encourage students to do is to start with a reflection, like actually address what the past looked like. Address the past first, um, and this could be through journaling, um, or just and I encourage them to actually write it down because when you write something down, it's almost as though you are um, releasing these thoughts, these emotions physically. You know, your brain is connected mm. to to that physical hand, and you can actually um, release these these emotions essentially. So I would encourage them to kind of journal write down what that past experience was like, what they believe to be true about that experience for them, you know, um, yes. what was in their control in terms of their circumstances and what was out of their control. And by asking these questions and digging into the past, they start to kind of um, start the process of letting go. And then we would perhaps have a follow-up consult and students um, come back and they say, wow, I didn't realize this about myself. I didn't realize that this is what was holding me back. Or, you know, they, they kind of, it kind of gives them perspective, having reflected on what that past experience was like. And then because they have this awareness of what it was like, they are able to decide what actions or steps they want to take um, to improve or what they want to bring into the current in space. Excellent. Can I ask you, does it ever happen that say you have a few sessions with a student, um, you talk through um, issues from the past, they say to you, oh, this is fantastic, um, I now know exactly what I need to do, I'm focused, I've dealt with everything I know, and then say, you know, two, three months later, suddenly you hear from them again and they say, oh, I failed a test and actually it's all fallen apart for me and I don't know what to do. So they've almost regressed in a way. Does that sometimes yeah. happen? That you can think you're actually, you know, your mindset is right, but then something happens to just upset it again. Mm. That happens more often than, than, our, than our hope for, but yeah. it is common. It's something that you can't almost change because sometimes the beliefs that we have about ourselves is so deeply rooted um, in who we are. It's, it stems from perhaps, you know, experiences like from childhood, experiences yeah. at school, like they're so deeply ingrained that it's hard to change them. And what we're trying to do is not change them completely, but to create an awareness of what triggers those beliefs for us and how best to manage those triggers essentially. So although I give students the tips or the strategy, it's up to them to be consistent in that, to form good habits surrounding that, and to be aware that it's not always going to be this way, that it's something that needs to constantly be being worked on. Um, throughout the process and, and beyond. It's something that if they are aware of it, if they can actively choose correct actions to improve on their mindset, eventually it becomes natural, it becomes easier. So it's all about exercising that ability and practicing that um, con consistently. It's almost like just like we need exercise physically, we also need exercise mentally. Exactly that, yeah. Um, I want to ask you about a lot of the Mill Park students and students in South Africa generally, let's just be clear about that, come from disadvantaged backgrounds. Um, I've done quite a lot of research uh, for various Mill Park articles about how students that come from more difficult surroundings, shall I say, you know, where there is more social injustice, where there's poverty, where there is gangsterism, where there is all where there are all kinds of problems. They come to a university setting already with dealing with more than many other mm. students from more privileged um, communities. You know, they deal have to deal with more, and this causes them more emotional stress and pressure and it makes it even harder I think to succeed then because you have to work and you have to study and you have all these other extra issues. Um, do you find that is true? Do you find that is the case as well with the students that you talk to? Mm -hmm. 
I'm going to say again that each student is unique yeah. because I think it really depends on the individual and their circumstances. It depends yeah. on the individual's drive and motivation um, and, you know, their ability to persevere despite their circumstances. So yeah. I, I can't say that it's it's completely true. I think those students who come from disadvantaged backgrounds are not aware of what, you know, those that come from a privileged background experience. Yeah. So the experience, also, although the circumstances are totally different, it really depends on how the individual views um, the ability to be successful. And again, stems from the the approach and mindset in terms of how they they view this program and what they want to achieve let me ask you in a different way i mean and we can use it or not use it as we will but do you think students from privileged backgrounds and uh, communities have more support um, and i'm talking specifically about a psychological uh, a parental a peer a family support than perhaps students mm -hmm. from more underprivileged societies um, not necessarily, necessarily. Okay. not necessarily, to be honest, like I haven't, I haven't had exposure to a student who was, who felt fully supported. Um, the support might look different. The mm -hmm. access to support might be different. Um, but I can't necessarily say that mm -hmm. students from privilege and underprivileged receive different forms of support. Let me ask you another question, which is also <laughs> slightly related to this, though. Do you think some students need more support than others? I do. I do feel that there are certain groups of students, if we want to group them, that might require additional support. Yeah. Um, and I don't like to stereotype or group put no, them into kind of, yes. you know, groups and things like that. But there are students who have experienced perhaps, like as you mentioned, trauma or have experienced perhaps failure too many times, um, that they are just a bit lost, that they are a bit uncertain of what the future holds. And they, they are almost, in a sense, kind of consumed or getting into the emotion of everything instead of, you know, the actions and that they need to take in order to to improve on themselves. So a group of students who have perhaps failed numerous times, I think might require more support than a student just coming into the program, um, having not experienced it before, um, in a sense. Um, I must say, because I've spoken to a lot of Milpock students as well about their, their journeys and their experiences, I have been able to sort of form quite an interesting portrait of of students because without naming names and we want to not you know reveal anyone's identity obviously um some students have experienced extraordinary obstacles but they are able to somehow succeed in spite of them and you wonder to yourself if that is character then or if where why would some students just kind of be able to do it without almost needing that much extra support and then others don't so what my question I think is, I don't know if you have an opinion about this idea of so-called character or if it is something that you work on constantly, if it's something mm. that you can just be born with, you know, that you just have this incredible drive to succeed and nobody will ever tell you, you that you can't and you just power on like a machine, whereas someone else might maybe just always be very susceptible and sensitive to criticism, mm. whether it's from themselves or somebody else. I don't know. what. Do you have an opinion on that? Um, so I do this live session after one of, I think, test one. It's called the growth mindset and the power of not yet, um, coined by a, a counseling psychologist, Carol Dweck. And okay. she speaks about these two mindsets, being a fixed mindset um, and a growth mindset. And a growth mindset, um, in, idea of the growth mindset is that intelligence can be developed. Um, your intelligence can be developed and on the opposite end of that fixed mindset, your intelligence is static, it cannot be developed, right? So I think we, from when I do that session, I mean, students have this realization like, wow, they're leaning into a fixed mindset or into a growth mindset. So it creates an awareness for them of what mindset they lean into. Um, fixed mindset, 
um, people are often, um, they don't do well with criticism. Um, when they are presented with a challenge, they hardly put in um, effort and they give up easily. Whereas students or people with a growth mindset tend to um, lean into effort. They lean into the challenge and they, they know that although it is something that is challenging for them, they can do it and it's just part of the learning process essentially. So I think what's important though is that having a self-awareness um, of like maybe these mindsets um, or just in general having a self-awareness is really important as to where you are headed in terms of direction. Um, so a lot of the students who perhaps lean into a fixed mindset, once they have that awareness of what is going on in their mind, what they're thinking about, who they are, who they think they are, um, what they believe to be true about themselves. Once they have a, a, an awareness of that, it kind of allows them to take corrective action or actions that are positive and that lead them on a path of achieving this growth mindset. It is something that I would say is constant, constantly needs to be worked on. Um, students can go, uh, could have a fixed mindset and growth mindset at the same time. They could be interchangeable depending on the scenario. But essentially, you want to work towards a growth mindset, which is just having a positive outlook on on life in general, on the thing, on the challenges that you are presented with. Um, so I think being secure in yourself um, is something that can be developed over time. But just to be clear. If you started out with a fixed mindset, is it possible to change that into a growth mindset? Yes, it's possible to do so. And it all has to do with your ability um, to be self-aware, but also to take the correct steps needed. Similarly to what I explained earlier on in terms of, you know, having to take, um, like, take, form good habits. Um, and form so that you can take the correct actions to lead you to the path that, and the outcomes that you want to achieve. And these good habits, what would they be, for instance? Would they be the journaling? Uh, would they be the, the self-awareness that you were talking about? Um, I think the good habits will come from what you unearth about yourself. Um, and good habits could be something as simple as exercising when you felt that you can't exercise it's you're not good at something and you and you're leaning into something that you felt you're not good at um, for example with a lot of our students who perhaps have a fixed mindset or have failed previously they have difficulty doing our practice questions and a and a corrective action would be oh, an awareness that there's avoidance of these practice questions because there's self-doubt and the practice questions are only going to reaffirm this belief that you are incapable. Um, so that's the awareness. Um, but then actually, be, because you're aware of it, doing the opposite, actually leaning into it, taking an action and a step that is the opposite of what you would normally take. So instead of avoiding it, you lean into it, you do that practice question um, and you start uh, kind of to break that cycle of doing the same thing. Um, in that way, you start to form a better habit. You start to form positive habits. And the more you have positive experiences or outcomes from you know, just doing those practice questions, the more it reaffirms a different belief, a belief that I can do this and perhaps I am capable um, going forward. Right. Can I ask you, what are the practice questions? Um, the practice questions are part of um, the lessons that students do. So they would do, um, in terms of their modules, each module is laid out with having lessons and then practice questions. Um, so they take you, they take you questions. Yeah, they technical questions, yeah. About the content, right? Yeah. Mm. Excellent. This is very, very interesting, I must say. Um, <laughs> I am going to come back to the question and see how we're doing there. Why do you think students relate to you and what you do? I'm not sure. <laughs> 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 okay, so... Maybe, maybe you're very pleasant <laughs> to me. Could it be that? <laughs> May, maybe. Like, if I'm talking from a, the personal perspective, maybe that's it. 
but if we're talking about perhaps support firstly um, I think that everyone seeks support you know they would like to know that it's an option they like to know that it's there so having support up front and center allows them a choice as to whether or not they you know they when they need it they can reach out they can um, they can connect like everyone as I said wants to feel supported in some way um, I think why students might resonate with me is perhaps because I act or can be viewed as almost a bridge between student, the student body and the institution. You know, I have certain insights from a wealth of students that I've interacted with that I can pass on to other students when I engage with them. Um, and students kind of see comfort see comfort in that they kind of like to know um that they are like they like to be reassured that's what i mean yeah um and like to know that they are on the right track so yeah um the next question that we have here is about the su successes you've had with students and why they were successes so i think we have touched on that but maybe mm. if you have some additional thoughts about that so I'm not sure. Like, let me let me rephrase. <laughs> let me rephrase the question. What would you see as a successful interaction with a student? Okay. So I've had I've had many interactions with students over the past year, where they come to me and they're obviously down and out when they come to me. They are really low in a low mood they don't believe in themselves and they're seeking some sort of guidance. And I think what I provide is a sense of hope um, that they can do this, right? So students have um, come to me from that perspective and through our conversation, you know, what I really enjoy seeing and when I see the growth is when they start actually um, pinpointing things that have caused them to to go off off track a little bit. They start to identify it for themselves. And eventually they come back and you see the growth in them. You see a different perspective. Like I had students who used to consult with me on a one-on-one -on -one and I suggested, why don't you join our group, like drop-in sessions, we call it, that we have every week. And eventually the student joined the sessions and you could just hear by the way the students spoke that they were lighter, that they were enlightened, that they were, um, that there was growth taking place. And I think for me that would, um, when there's growth taking place, um, both academically, but also most importantly, like on a personal level, I think you see the change in that student. It comes to the fore in the way they speak, in the way they assist others and um, like, like contribute to the, to the community of students. That is wonderful. No, that's lovely to hear. Um, can I ask you around self-belief? How important is self-belief, believing in yourself? To me personally or in general? I think both. <laughs> yeah, I think both. Um, I think it I think believing in yourself is is important because you reaffirm your confidence, you reaffirm your ability to be bold and take on a challenge. Um and it almost allows you to progress. Um, it's, it might be what motivates you or keeps you grounded. So having a good like self-belief or confidence in your abilities is, is really vital for you to be, I would say, successful in anything that you want, who you want to achieve. And for students, do you think it's possible to be successful if you don't really believe in yourself? I do. I do feel so. But at at some point, as I mentioned previously, like if you have good experiences, enough good experiences, it eventually allows you to develop a self-belief. Is, is bad self-belief the same thing as insecurity? I need to think about that a bit more. <laughs> Sorry, that, yeah, no, that just occurred to me. Do you know when people say, oh, he's very insecure? I mean, it obviously they refer, mm. they mean that in terms of themselves and the way that somebody might 
react in a conversation or say things mm. that might come across negative, people will say, oh, but he's or she's insecure. I don't mm. know if that necessarily means that you don't really have a strong belief in yourself, if that mm. has something to do with that. No, I mean, it's not just, yeah. yeah. It's not, like, I don't think so either. Like, I don't yes. think... It, it means you have a bad self-belief it could just be momentarily where you saying a few things and you yes. you know you project that but so uh, what I'm hearing from you and I think this is something you said earlier on in our conversation is that it could be possible for somebody who does not have a strong self-belief who's not really sure that they can achieve something mm -hmm. um if they're not under pressure sufficiently or if they have a lot of support, they might be able to continue quite far in their studies mm. regardless of the self, of, of, a, of say, a bad self-belief. Mm. But once the pressures start mounting, yeah. this comes under pressure. And if it's stronger, mm. it will help you to succeed. Exactly. Like, I think students who, um, you know, perhaps deal well under pressure you know they don't need like we don't always need to be as self-aware or we are not always as self-aware um you know when we navigate things but i think students who perhaps are under pressure and start to feel the pressure start to feed into um you know their feelings of being overwhelmed eventually they realize that they need that additional support that there might be areas that they need to improve on or work on to develop a greater belief in themselves because these are things that they never confronted before or that they were unaware of before um, this experience you know and everyone else might just be able to navigate it without even being self-aware they just like take on the challenge, um, are able to just get through the work, um, understand it and, and end up being successful. Um, yeah. So it's not every single student that, that experiences it in the same way. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, I had a thought now and it just disappeared. <laughs> I hate it when that happens. <laughs> um, uh, I can't remember what I wanted to ask you now. Um, Anyway, oh, this is what I wanted to ask you. Is how unusual do you think it is for a tertiary or a higher education institution to have a psychologist like you interacting in, at this sort of level with students? Okay, so I'm not a psychologist. I'm a registered counsellor. Okay. <laughs> I just wanted to say that. Yes. Um, but I think what was the question again how unusual how unusual is it to be working at this level because i know some universities they mm. have student services right i don't know what it mm. what shape and form that always takes but yeah at mill park it's quite a an active and a very sort of structured interaction that you have with students how common is that to have this kind of service i think it is i don't know how common it, it it is to be to per se but I do know that the e-support structures at universities um, where there are psychologists that students can can lean into like I think um, I think it was perhaps when it was my third year or fourth year um, studying at the university I actually realized that there is a student like support body that um, caters to students but there's not much awareness of that or um yeah like we don't make enough noise about it um for students to actually go and take up that opportunities i'm not sure if it's because it's we are online institution and it and it appears to be more prevalent and more visible um but i think i haven't almost engaged with an institution or viewed an institution where there is this level of support yes. i think it also it also stems from like the institution and its and its values um in itself like they they wanting to you know care for the students um on a, on a different level and i think we've recognized that support is necessary for success on, on our program especially. So I would say it is perhaps unusual in this space, specifically perhaps to PGDA, where there is this form of support available to our students. Um, and would you say that from the Mill Park management, you did say that now, but um, I just want you to sort of 
expand a little bit more about it, that it's quite a an important uh, part of the program for them, the, the, the student support, the psychological support, that the counselling support that they get. It's not mm-hmm. just kind of a box that's being ticked, right? Mm. Yeah, like it's definitely not a box that's being ticked. It's something that they are passionate about. They realize that it's something that is needed. Um, and they they really are, I don't want to speak on their behalf specifically, but I do know that they, they are passionate about um, fulfilling um, this space in terms of um, psychotherapy and just support for our students and perhaps expanding on that a little bit more. I want to ask you, I, I remembered now what I wanted to ask you just now. How difficult is it for students to ask for help? It, it really depends on the nature of the mm. student. And I mm. think in society itself, I think if we look at South Africa or just um, the type of people um, we I think a lot of us are hardworking people. We want to do things independently. Um, we want to be able to achieve things. You know, we're good at executing things and tackling things. And I think that plays a factor as to why we often find it challenging to to stop and and mm-hmm. ask for help. Um, to stop and and ask, you know for assistance when we are not coping. That's something that um, students do grapple with in this space um, because they always feel as though they need to do it perhaps on their own. Or um, I think at times when you are dealing with um, academics, for example, it could also be, or the lecturers, it can also appear quite intimidating to our students. Um, so usually the first point of call is is myself. They come to me to seek some support and, and some guidance. So um, it's hard for them to ask for support, but I think it's becoming a bit more prominent. Like when, the, when one student comes to me, it's almost as though they start telling other students and eventually mm-hmm. there's this community around you know, or this awareness in the community that, hey, this is the support that's on offer. This is um, a place you can come where they actually genuinely um, provide you with care and guidance and want you to to better yourself. Um, And what I've also experienced actually is that students eventually, when they come to like, for example, me, or they come to a drop-in session, or when they've experienced the support from our lecturers and our staff, eventually it trickles down into the student community and you start to see students um, actually supporting one another on the various platforms in the sessions and it takes a life of its own eventually um, where the values or passion or purpose that we as as the institution hold starts filtering into our student community Um, and for me that's just amazing that's when you know um, you know you you're on the right track just writing that down that is wonderful that's really lovely i must say mm-hmm. i have found that a lot when i speak to students and i ask them what advice would they have you know for students still doing the program yeah. they say make use of the resources make use yeah. of the supportives it's there to help you and they would say that they discovered it too late or they took too long mm. or they waited too long before they did it true yeah mm. Okay, Terry, I think we have, yeah, I we have spoken now for an hour, <laughs> yes. <laughs> and um, okay. let me get back to my video. Where are you? There you are. Thank you very much. It's been a very interesting conversation. Mm-hmm. And I think I've gotten quite a lot of material. I think I also have a lot for an article as well. Um, mm-hmm. And the shape that would take is you would see it in any case before it Mm. you know the press or anything like that so don't worry about that i'll chat to hanley and to inam at the office and see how we structure that but mm. um it would be around sort of like three tips or five tips or things you can do to mm. bolster your mental health i suppose while studying okay. something like that, you know and okay. then it would be based on what we were talking about because you had quite specific things to say as well and how they work which is nice you know because sometimes mm. we say you know 
have more positive thoughts. People don't really know what that means. It means, you yeah. Quite clear, sort of, in, in terms of your structure and the students, what works. And I think mm. that's really that's awesome. Should yeah. I stop the recording quickly? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah.